Please welcome Ericsson Vice President and Global Head of Cloud Infrastructure, Jason Hoffman. Oh. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you for Red Hat for having us, and uh, thank you to the, the previous speakers as well. Um, we heard a lot about going from the past to the present, and we're going to shift gears in this presentation and talk about the future. Uh, largely uh, four areas that I'm at least mindful of when we think about what the future needs to be. And, and you can think of these as anywhere ranging from thought-provoking to sort of future guardrails for, for yourself. Um, there'll be four of them. Now, to introduce Ericsson, as we, there we go. Uh, we'll do a, a, a brief introduction about ourselves. I mean, we are a 141-year-old a uh, Swedish, Swedish multinational, roughly 110,000 people. Um, our products are present in 187 countries. Um, and if you see a 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, or soon to be 5G on your phone, uh, we, we, we do that. Um, and providing these types of telecommunication systems has is, is been the business for the entire 141 years uh, of the company. Uh, there's roughly about 3 billion subscribers on our products, and then we, we manage networks that have about a billion subscribers on it. So we're, we tend to be both a, a customer and a, a vendor in this type of, this type of space. So moving into the, the four areas, uh, the first one is there's always going to be this constant cyclical back and forth between capabilities and hardware and what we do in software. Um, hardware always uh, outpaces software. Uh, virtualization really becoming possible and then taking off roughly 2009 was because of things like VTX and extended page tables and, and Intel chips. Um, and one thing I'd like to, to comment in this section is we're actually on the verge of a, another sort of revolution in what we're doing from a, from a hardware perspective, that we are starting to introduce um, fully optical systems into the data center. Uh, we have pooled MVNE showing up. We have large sort of network addressable clusters of hardware accelerators. And there, there's a lot of interesting sort of innovation going on inside of there. And then what we have to do on the software side is actually use what's in the hardware. Um, and we have to drive a certain simplification that if we take some, some analog examples to start with, um, this, is, this is a bunch of longshoremen lo loading up a, a, a ship uh, in roughly the sort of 1950s, an exceptionally sort of manual job. And then, of course, over the last 50 years, we've seen a tremendous amount of innovation, largely in the creation of the pallet inside of warehouses and, and the container ship. Now, when you look at container ships, these are, in fact, very automated you know, ships, very automated ports, very automated facilities. And there's a significant amount of simplification that actually occurs when you look at these types of analog environments. And we have to take this same type of simplification approach in what we're doing from a software perspective. So like a, a big activity we do is, is we've, we've talked about NFV and network function virtualization infrastructure. And then, of course, we're a very large provider of these VNFs that go on top of it. I, I, I prefer to think of that drive as largely two drives. So one is this infrastructure needs to be simpler. It needs to be more automated. There needs to be sort of common governance of, of, of these types of things. Virtualization happens to be a tool, but it's not the point. And it may be sort of a good tool right now. It may not have been a good tool in the past. It may not be a good tool in the future, but it's a, it's a tool. And we have to distinguish somewhat between the hammer versus the house versus the home. And what I'm consistently sort of looking for in these types of software systems are, are we taking out as much as we're putting in? Are we flattening the layers? And I think that's, 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 that's a big thing that I'm mindful of as we look at what the future needs to be. Are we taking out as much as we're putting in, or even more? The second area is 
software-defined infrastructure is starting another revolution that not everyone may be aware of because it tends to be on the physical side of things. It tends to actually be on data center designs themselves as well as the, the systems that go inside of these data centers. So when we think of a very basic question of how do we start designing mechanical systems and how do we start designing facilities for robotic systems and physical automation, we've seen this already occur in things like car factories. And so of course, this is a car factory from roughly sort of 60, 60 years ago. And then when we look at modern ones, when you walk into like a modern BMW factory, they're an exceptionally automated line. And so end to end, you have very sort of rapidly moving robotic systems assembling all of this from a, from a, from a physicality standpoint. We see the same thing in the data center. If you go in the data center today, everything is designed with management ports in the front, assuming that somebody has to go plug um, a laptop in. Um, the physical design of these things hasn't really changed in roughly 30 years. And then if you look at a lot of the type of infrastructure we touch, it ranges from typical looking data center infrastructure, you know, all the way out to roughly 30, 40 different form factors for base stations that sort of go out in the wild and have to live in the rain all the time. The, the reality is, yes, there's a lot of data centers, but then there's also a, a lot of other facilities that live between sort of the radio edge in these data centers. There's a tremendous amount of physical heterogeneity inside of these that, that, that drive the need for people to show up and, and do something. You know, in the base station space, we've seen things like exponentially decreasing cost of a base station. However, it still costs the same amount for somebody to go out into a jungle and install it. These have to be sort of automated as well. Um, and we see these types of, you know, physical design showing up in the data center. Try to hit the, the button again. Um, where you start looking at systems that actually have mag connects on the back. You look at things that have integrated sort of heating and cooling. Uh, you look at taking uh, storage uh, across very sort of vertical infrastructure. You look at the disaggregation of the type of components that are there. That a lot of the things that we're enabling from software-defined infrastructure, for those of us that are data center facility geeks, is it in fact changes how the facility looks as well. And so I think you can expect a tremendous amount of physical automation going on and how these are handled as well. Um, and the industrial design work here is you know, interesting. Uh, data centers don't have to be square or rectangular. It actually makes sense for them to look like a chimney. A, a number of sort of things like that. But the basic question would be, if I need to now sort of physically automate this type of thing, if I actually want to start thinking of this infrastructure like a factory, why don't we take all the learnings from physical automation of factories and start applying it to these things as well? That's the second big trend that we see that we're doing. The third area is whether you realize it or not, you're sitting in one of three architectural design centers. So you're either doing a network-centric type design, which of course for ourselves is a traditional network equipment manufacturer and, and the like. Uh, we've sat in designs like that. You're doing something that's very application or service-centric, or you're doing something that's data-centric. And these are three different design centers. So if you look at sort of network equipment, the push there has always been to, to optimize what it does. Okay? But a good example of this from the analog world would be just a, a simp simple sort of case here. So we've, we've all put our, you know, if you have kids, you've put your kids in the back seat of the car and driven them around. Um, the road is your network. Uh, the car is the compute that's actually transporting you across this road. But the child in sort of the back seat is the data. And if you think about sort of the point of this, the point of this is to get the child safely to visit the grandparents or get the child sort of safely to school. That in fact, what we're sort of seeing is much more of a concern around data at the center of everybody's design. But that actually impacts many of us much more than I think we realize. So if you then start thinking of a of a world where rather than building network equipment that gets highly optimized for that and then thinking about how to add storage and compute capabilities to it, you know, there's been tens and tens if not hundred plus sort of startups in the space that has realized that sticking a lot of storage inside of a chassis router will never be a good idea. 
um, and it won't be economical to do it. If you look for many of us that have been selling servers, you know, the idea that you get a server that you put your application on it and storage is an afterthought that you mount and the network is a thing that you connect that you assume always works and it's another group that even runs it, you know, then you end up with, with that sort of design center. If you look at what the hyperscale cloud providers have been doing, is pretty much entirely sort of data-centric designs. In the traditional storage industry, it took us years to add things like deduplication and encryption to a tr traditional SAN NAS environment. But if you want to do deduplication on something like Amazon's S3, you know, you upload something, it fires off the simple notification service, it fires off a Lambda job, it looks up a checksum inside a Dynamo, fires off the second function in the Lambda job that decides to keep or delete the file. It takes one of us an afternoon and a few hundred lines of JavaScript to basically implement deduplication in a data-centric type environment. When you look at like what the Google Cloud guys have done, that's an entirely serverless type data pipeline across those types of, 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 of data services. It's not this idea of how do I deploy a VM and how do I do this and how do I mount my storage or the like. You're actually doing compute functionality across these data environments. And that's actually what eliminates the silos, is, a, is an architectural shift. So what's the data? Compute network is a feature of that environment. The, uh, the other area that we think about quite a bit um, for ourselves is, is can we even design the next platform? And, and what I mean by that is from an Ericsson standpoint, there's, there's two bookends to this infrastructure. You know, one bookend is the very industrialized approach that the hyperscale guys are taking in public clouds. And, and when I say hyperscale, it means that you actually have continuously improving capabilities and capacity, but you have exponentially decreasing unit economics of that environment. The, the other sort of bookend is like what we've done with the actual sort of radio networks that your phone connects to. That's also been something where we've managed to increase capacities and increase capabilities while actually taking a significant amount of cost out of that infrastructure. Um, on one end, you have hundreds of sites with a large-scale cloud provider. On the other end, you have tens of millions of sites globally that talk to sort of billions of devices. Um, that is a very large, event-driven, algorithmically driven global machine in sort of many ways. If you start looking at what's in the middle, what's in the middle is tens of thousands of facilities with pretty much the computer history museum of hardware and operating systems and thousands and thousands of control systems inside of it. Many ways, the whole push that we're doing with NFVI and, and SDN and software-defined infrastructure, all, all these sort of tag words, is about that complete industrialization of the middle mile, taking into account aspects that you could learn from the radio edge and aspects you can learn from hyperscale cloud providers. But you're starting to head into these environments where the complexity of them and the choices one has to make is a little more difficult than just selecting 12,418 availability zones from a pull-down menu of 100,000 availability zones. The, the, the way that we think about these systems is, is, is not going to be terribly uh, doable. Now, we have some good examples of this. Um, this is a human fertilized egg that's done its first cell division. Um, we have 40 trillion of these cells in our body. That's what a human's basically made up of. And if you look at sort of base lines of code inside of a human cell, it's roughly about 3 billion lines of code. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is this eventually does continue to grow up. Um, and if you look at the characteristics of this, this is a machine um, that's the easiestly made machine by unskilled labor, basically, right? It's capable of learning. It's intelligent, it's autonomous, it's modular, it's resilient, it's long living. At the core is roughly three billion lines of code, but about another 10 to 100x, we don't know exactly of other information density that lives on top of it. Um, we don't engineer these, we study them. And the types of systems that we're starting to do now, we have to start studying more of what's out there. We need computer science to turn into a science that we study 
We see bits of this already in that um, the compute space has gone from you know, one transistor to sort of one vacuum tube to you know, a trillion transistors in sort of roughly 60 years. Now again, as I told you, just one of us has 40 trillion transistors inside of it called cells. So there's, there's a lot that we can do around sort of studying these types of systems. We have some impact on this now in that deep learning systems are based on neural networks, which are based on compute systems that model the way we think the human brain works. Now, of course, the interesting thing here is we don't always train these well. Not all of them are successful. And when they are, we actually don't know how they work. But the studying of the way that infrastructure currently is and the way that we're turning it is the creation of a very large data set that can be fed into these types of systems that allow us to start thinking about what the interfaces have to be and what the system designs have to be when we're looking at now very sort of distributed systems. I mean, when we say things like edge compute, you're talking about deployments out into potentially thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of sort of sites. It's not something that we're going to get from a pull down menu. And then finally, these ideas of simplification, automation, uh, data-centric type designs, but then most importantly, the fact that these current systems and the new ones have to be studied, and we have to take that data in to sort of, you know, systems that we can learn on that and change how it is. Now, to wrap up, when we look at um, ourselves and what we've been doing in the space and what we've been doing in the space with, with, with Red Hat, um, for the last three years, we've been working with a, a number of customers to, of course, uplift traditional telecom environments into fully sort of virtualized networks that are meant to be simpler, automated, highly accessible, and capable of continuously improving, you know, to sort of break the type of legacy hamster wheel that we sort of sit on. Now what we've sort of done in 2016, 2017 is bringing on now hundreds of millions of subscribers onto these types of fully virtualized networks. And we have a goal of actually bringing that up to sort of a billion subscribers on these type of networks as we head into 2018. It's also in our minds a prerequisite for 5G and all the things you would like to do with 5G. Now, when you look at what these environments all are, these environments are using OpenStack for all the accessibility of these environments. And, and most importantly, it's become clear that OpenStack is meant to make aspects of the operating system programmable. There's a desire to almost uniformly adopt Linux in the telecom space. I mean, there has been for years. Uh, and our number one partner in that space is, is Red Hat. So with that, thank you everybody very much. Hopefully there's uh, four fun things to think about. And uh, talk to you all later. <laughs>